Hi guys, in the last video we looked at ionic bonding. In this video we're going to look at the properties of ionic compounds. But before we do that, let's get into the starter questions. So the first one says complete the ionic dot and cross diagram for sodium chloride. So we need to look at this diagram here. And if you remember from the last video, every element needs a full outer shell, and that is 8. So this one here, this fluorine atom, has 7 electrons, and this sodium has 1. And the best way for sodium and fluorine to achieve a full outer shell is if this sodium here donates the electron to fluorine. So you need to draw now the new atoms showing what's happened to the electrons. So I'm going to draw two new circles, one for the sodium and one for the fluorine. Sodium has lost its electron, so it's now empty here. And then the fluorine has seven of its own electrons, which we're going to do as crosses and then one dot from the sodium. But that's not finished. We need to now show the charge. And we do this by putting brackets around the atom and then indicating it's now an ion by writing the correct charge. Sodium has lost one electron, so it becomes positive, and fluorine has gained one electron, so it becomes negative. And that's all you need to do. All right, the next question says, how many electrons are in the outer shell of group seven? Well, in the last video, I gave you a tip to say that whatever the group number is, that's how many electrons there are. So in here, there would be seven electrons. And then finally, what is the charge on an electron? Electrons are negatively charged. And you'll see it sometimes written like that to show negative. It's a shorthand way of saying it. Right, another recap then. I'd like you to pause the video and try and fill in the blanks. And then unpause the video for the answers. Right guys, let's go through the answers. Ionic bonding is the bonding between a metal and a non-metal, where the metal donates its electrons to become positive, and the non-metal receives electrons to become negatively charged. And that's effectively what ionic bonding is. You should already have that in your notes from the previous video. Okay guys, in this slide we have two pictures, and these are what we call ionic lattices. And a lattice is just a regular 3D repeating structure. So, these would be the ions in sodium chloride. You would have this smaller one here, which is your chlorine, and your larger one here, which would be your sodium. And it's the same for this one here. The green ones are all of your sodium ions, and all your purple ones are your chlorine. And what this shows us is how those ions are arranged in an ionic bond, or in this case, an ionic lattice. And there's some positives and negatives about each type of diagram. For the first one here, for A, this is really good because it shows the different sizes of the ions. It shows the smaller chlorine and the larger sodium. But it's also got a disadvantage. This diagram indicates that there's gaps between the different atoms, sorry, the different ions. And that's not the case. They're actually much more compact than this and much closer together. So if you look at this one, you'll see that this is also really good because it shows the different sized ions in the structure. But it's a bad diagram, or it has a disadvantage, because it doesn't really show what's happening inside of the lattice, like this one. This one just shows you what's happening on the surface of the structure. And in your GCSEs, you may get asked to describe the advantages and disadvantages of different diagrams. Now, they're very complicated to draw, so I'm going to ask you to draw this in your notes. This is a simplified version of an ionic lattice. You're going to draw a larger sodium ion, and you're going to put a plus there to indicate that sodium plus. That's a sodium ion. And then you're going to draw a slightly smaller chlorine ion, and that's a negatively charged ion. Then you're going to do a sodium again, and you're going to alternate this. So sodium, chlorine, sodium, chlorine, and you should get the idea of this pattern here now. You're just going to do alternating ions until you've got a square structure. Now you'll notice that I've tried to keep the chlorine smaller than the sodiums, but that hasn't always worked. I hope you take a little more care when you're drawing these so that these sizes are correct. Now that's not finished. In between each one of these ions, I want you to do some dashed lines. And the reason for that, I will explain in a second. 
So as you're working through, just do dashed lines between every single iron. And what this shows is that these irons are held together. They're held together strongly by what we call electrostatic forces. Electrostatic forces. And these require a lot of energy to break. And that's why table salt is a solid at room temperature. It hasn't quite reached the energy required or the temperature required to break down this structure. So now you can see that an ionic lattice is alternating positive and negative charges. And in between each iron is electrostatic forces, which are a strong force of attraction holding these irons together. And you need to keep the idea with you as we go through this PowerPoint. So I'm going to tell you how the structure of an ionic compound affects its properties. So for example, its melting and boiling point, its solubility and its conductivity. So if we start with the melting and boiling point, we've already discussed that the electrostatic forces in an ionic compound are very strong. That means they need a lot of energy to break or to be overcome. So they have high melting and boiling points. Their solubility. This one is probably the easiest of the three. You don't necessarily have to understand why they're soluble, just that they are. So their solubility, they are soluble in water. And finally, their conductivity. Now, to explain this, I'm going to draw a diagram. I'm going to very quickly draw the structure that you have just seen on the previous slide. But this time, I'm going to ignore the electrostatic forces and I'm just going to draw them like this, all close together, alternating the positive and negative charges. So this is our structure as a solid. This is our ionic structure as a solid. Now, it can't conduct electricity as a solid because the ions are fixed. They cannot move. And if the ions can't move, then they cannot conduct electricity. So when ionic compounds are solid, they do not conduct. However, if you do two things to these, so you can either melt them or you can dissolve them, then they do conduct electricity. So let's have a look at the melting of this first. If you melt them, the ions become free to move. Breaks the electrostatic forces because it's such a high temperature. And what you can then see is that the ions are now separated. There's space between them. So they do conduct electricity. And it's the same thing when you dissolve it. The water molecules break up this ionic lattice, this ionic structure and leave the ions much further apart, separated. So now, again, because there's space between them, they are now free to move, so they do conduct. What I'd like you to do is listen to this little bit of the video again, and then pause the video and explain why these things happen. So you know that they have high melting and boiling points, that they're soluble in water, and that they conduct when either melted or dissolved. But I'd like you to explain why. So why do they have high melting points? And why do they only conduct when melted or dissolved? Right, hopefully you've had a go at that. The answers are in the video, but it will require you to go back and listen to it again. Now I'm gonna leave you with the four questions to have a go at, like we always do. Have a go at them. Post your answers in the comments below if you want me to check any, or if you need any support or feedback, Stick a comment in the box below and I'll get back to you. See you later.